Well, this evening, let's turn back to uh, John chapter 17 and look at the next section in this prayer that Jesus offered for us as his church. Uh, what I'd like to do is read uh, verses 6 through 10, and that will be our, um, our text this evening. Jesus uh, says this, he says, <clears throat> praise, I have manifested or revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but, uh, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing to our understanding this evening may help us to understand what it is that Jesus is praying here. But again, particularly to understand that this prayer that Jesus offers was not for everyone, but it was for those whom the Father had given to him. So having prayed now, as we saw in the first section, for the strength to carry out the work which um, uh, the Father had given Jesus to do, and in light of the fact that the Father was going to answer that prayer, the certainty that He was going to do that, um, having requested that the Father then would grant Him the reward of the glory, remember that Jesus possessed with the Father from all eternity, uh, Jesus now turns His attention more particularly to pray for His church. Now we do need to remember that um, this is a prayer uh, for the church for those that belong to Jesus. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but I think it was worth drawing our attention to it again, that the tendency in the church, the broad evangelical church today, is to apply whatever the Bible says, at least with regard to the promises of blessing and the love which God has, which He expresses toward the churches, towards His people, to apply that to the whole world. These things, they believe, belong to everyone. But we do need to understand that God's Word is not addressed to the world. It's addressed to His people with the exceptions of the warnings that He gives and the gospel that He gives to His people to declare to the world. I mean, that is addressed to the world, but it's given to the church to declare to the world so that the world might be warned that they might be convicted, awakened, and that they might actually turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. With, with those exceptions, really, there aren't, those aren't even exceptions. The Bible is addressed to the church. Well, the same thing is true with regard to this prayer. Jesus doesn't pray for the world here. He prays for those who belong to Him. He prays for those whom the Father had given to him, those that, that he had given to, them, to him then, that is for his disciples, and those he had yet to give him in the future, and he prays for those only. Now, the fact that he offers this prayer and that his intercession is exclusively for the church is really one of the clearest arguments that the work that Jesus did, really the entirety of his work, uh, was not for the world in general, but was for His people in particular. Those whom the Father foreknew or foreloved and chose in eternity, those that, as we've already seen in John's Gospel, Jesus calls His sheep. Now this evening, what I want us to do is basically look at three things. First of all, that Jesus here clearly is praying for His church and not for the world. Uh, secondly, how we can know that Jesus here is actually praying for us because what He gives to us are some particular uh, marks that He points out in His disciples as to how He knows that the Father had given them to Him. And then as we think about the fact that Jesus 
died and prays only for his church, how that will affect or whether it should affect our evangelism. Okay, so those are three things we're going to look at. First of all, let's look at the fact that Jesus prays only for those who belong to him, only for those the Father has given to him and not for the world. Now, that's obviously quite plain in verse 9. He says, Jesus says, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Now, when he says that he asks on their behalf, he's talking about those that he's been describing to us in verses 6 through 8, and we're actually going to come back to, to those particular things that he points out in them that showed Jesus that they actually belong to him. Uh, so, we'll look at that, as I said, in just a moment, but he describes them in this verse as he did in verse 2 by those words, those whom you have given me. Uh, these are the ones he said in verse 2 that he gives eternal life to and they will never perish. They are the elect. They are those whom the Father has chosen and given to Jesus as a part of his reward for the work that he has done in redemption. Those are those, his brethren, those who are going to be made like him as we saw this morning. Now, the things that he goes on to pray for them in this chapter also show us that these can only be true believers. It can't be referring to the world in general because he says, well, what he prays for in this chapter, and we'll look at this as we go through, not tonight, but as we go through this prayer, he prays that the Father would keep them, protect them. In other words, Jesus having saved them, he prays as he, well, as he also mentioned or said in John chapter 10, that you would keep them in your hands. That the, he goes, I give eternal life to them and they would never perish. The Father who gave them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. Jesus will pray, Father, protect them, keep them. He prays that they may be one with him and with his Father. Now that, I believe, is the burden of this prayer because that comes about by the giving of the Holy Spirit, that oneness is brought about by that love the Spirit of God gives. He prays for them that they might have His joy made full in them. And of course, that comes from a variety of things as we've been seeing, but Jesus is going to wrap all those things up and pray for, well, for us, that the Father would grant all these things so that we would have a fullness of joy. He prays that the Father would keep them from the evil one, that they might be sanctified by the truth, and that one day they might be with Him and see Him, to see His glory. Now again, all those things can only be true of the church, it can only be true of the, of the elect, of those who are actually going to make it to heaven. And of course, the, the world's response to them, which Jesus also mentions throughout this prayer, clearly shows that they don't belong to the world. He says they are not of the world. They are hated by the world. And they are those that the Lord is sending into the world in order that they might preach His gospel. Now this shows us, again, the nature of the work that Jesus came to do. That it has a specific focus. That there are certain individuals that he came to save. Now, we have a, a phrase for this that we sort of use to summarize what we're talking about. We call it particular redemption. Jesus came into the world to save a particular group of people. He did not come into the world to save the whole world because if he had done that, and if he had laid out his life for the whole world, if he had prayed for the whole world, then the whole world would be saved, but that is not what we see. Now this shouldn't surprise us because Jesus already told us back in John chapter 10 as much with regard to the focus of His, of his atonement, who it was He was laying His life down for. He says in verses 14 and 15, which I believe was our meditation this evening, I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, 
and I lay down my life for the sheep. I've already told you at the beginning what this means is not for the sheep and for the world, but just for the sheep. Now notice Jesus says he knows those that belong to him. Those are the ones that the Father has given to him. And he says his own know him. You see, there's, again, that knowing is more than just I know who they are. And we know it's more than just our knowing who Jesus is. But this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom they have sent, or whom you have sent. This is an intimacy of relationship that comes about through the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know him? And how does he know us? In the same way, the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father. That's the kind of relationship we have with the shepherd. A very intimate relationship, and that's, again, the burden of Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17. But it's these, specifically, that he says that he lays down his life. It's for them. It's for us if we know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many people argue today that anyone could potentially be one of his sheep if they would just simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we, we would have to admit that is true. If anyone believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they certainly are one of his sheep. But it isn't true that everyone is potentially one of his sheep because Jesus clearly tells us in the same chapter that there are those who are not his sheep. Uh, he said to those Jews that didn't believe in him in verse 26 of John chapter 10, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. I keep coming back to this verse because I think it's, it's so telling. Jesus does not say here, you are not of my sheep because you do not believe, which implies that if they did believe that they would be his sheep. But now think about this. He says, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. The fact that they are not his sheep to begin with is why they don't believe. The Father had not chosen them, and he had not given them to Jesus. Now again, um, that is what we mean by particular redemption. That's what it means that the Father has chosen, that He has given some to Jesus, but others He has not given. We don't like to think about the, the, the others. Uh, people want to put that out of their mind, but the fact is there are others, others whom He has not granted this mercy and this grace. Well, the sheep are those whom He has chosen, whom He has granted this mercy, and they believe because they are His sheep. They don't become His sheep by believing. Now, as we noted this morning, just as the old covenant priests were, were appointed by God to sacrifice and to pray for God's people, for His chosen people, in order that they might be reconciled to Him, and then we'd have to kind of, you know, uh, think about what that means. It was more or less typological. It was not a full redemption. It was not salvation because most of those people were not saved, but it was at least a picture of what he was going to do through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, just as he ordained those Old Testament priests to sacrifice and pray that the people might be reconciled to him, so the Father has appointed the Lord Jesus Christ as the priest of the new covenant that he might pray for us and that he might sacrifice himself for us, for his chosen people, that we might be reconciled to him. The work that Jesus was appointed to was only for God's chosen people, just as the priests in the Old Testament didn't pray for the nations, and they didn't sacrifice for the nations, but rather they sacrificed and prayed for God's people. So this, again, has, is, shows us the focus of our Lord's work, that it was particularly for those whom the Father has given to Him, which He says over and over again. Now, a more important question is, how can we know that what Jesus has done in His praying and in His sacrifice, that, that that has to do with us? How can we know that He has done this for us, that we are a part of His chosen people 
and that we are not a part of the world. Well, Jesus actually tells us in verses 6 through 8. Now, some of the things that he says in, this, in these verses simply remind us again that he's praying specifically for the elect. It doesn't help us really to distinguish whether or not we are of his elect. He says in verse 6 that those he prays for belong to the Father. He says they were yours. Okay? These are the ones the Father chose. He says again in verse 6, they are those the Father has given Jesus. They were yours and you gave them to me. Okay, so that's, again, those are the ones for whom he is praying, but that doesn't help us know whether or not we belong to that group. Um, they are those the Father has chosen to give to Jesus as a part of the reward for his work. I should note in verse 10 that um, Jesus also says something very interesting. Um, he says, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Shouldn't surprise us that those that belong to the Father have been given to Jesus, because everything they possess, they possess together. And I think that's true of all three persons of the Godhead. Certainly, again, I believe when we're talking about Jesus and the Father, we're probably referring, or Scripture is referring to the Trinity and the Mediator. Uh, and again, that can be a little bit confusing because the person of the Son of God is in the Godhead as well as in the person or the man, Christ Jesus. He's not a split personality or anything like that, but he does exist in these two natures, and we have to do some justice to that. But there is this relationship, and so God is giving all that he has to his Son and everything that belongs to him belongs to him, and everything that belongs to him belongs to God, and they possess everything together mutually, and that includes those whom the Father has chosen and given to his Son. But again, more specifically, how do we know that he chose us and has given us to his Son? Well, there's basically three evidences that Jesus gives here, three markers, you might say, three marks of grace, and the Bible is actually full of those. But I'll put them as questions because these are questions we should be asking ourselves. And if we belong to Him, these are things we should be able to say yes to. First of all, has Jesus revealed the Father to you? He says in, in verse 6, I have manifested or I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. Okay, I have revealed you, God. I have revealed you, Father, to those who belong to me. Well, if you belong to Jesus, Jesus has revealed the Father to you. And you have seen him. You have seen him in Christ. And you understand who he is. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, we need to understand that's the reason why Jesus came into the world, wasn't it, in the first place? He came to reveal or to explain the Father to us. John writes in John 1, verse 18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Remember, Jesus is the one who was with God uh, who created all things and who became flesh and tabernacled among us. And the reason why he came into the world was so that he might reveal God to us. Well, has he revealed God to you? Do you see God in Christ Jesus? Remember what Jesus told Philip? That to see him is to see the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. Well, you haven't seen God in His essence. You haven't seen the eternal, infinite, unchangeable, you know, Spirit of God, as it were, the, you know, the, uh, that, well, that, we might say, the divine revelation of God, which, if we see, would destroy us. But we have seen His nature. We have seen His character. We have seen His, well, the revelation of who He is. Have you seen that? Have you seen God in Christ Jesus? Do you believe that He is God in our nature? And more importantly, do you love that God that you see? You see, this is something that Jesus, well, the Father, has only revealed to those that belong to Jesus. They see that, they acknowledge that, 
and they love the one they see. So that's the first mark. Has Jesus revealed the Father to you? Secondly, do you believe that Jesus was sent by the Father and have you received him? Uh, that's what you will do if, if Jesus has revealed the Father to you. You will certainly embrace him. Now, Jesus says in verses 7 and 8, and again, he says a number of things here, but I believe this is the essence of what he's saying. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believed that you sent me. If you belong to Jesus, you believe that what Jesus says is true. You believe that the words that he speaks are the Father's words, that they are the word, that it is the word of God. You believe that the Father sent him into the world to be a savior and to exalt him as Lord. And you not only believe that, but you have acted upon it and you have received him as your Lord and as your savior. So the second question is, is, is that true of you? <laughs> Do you, have you received those words? Have you received that truth? Do you believe what Jesus is saying? And have you received him? If it is true of you, then you are chosen of the Father, and Jesus was praying for you. And then thirdly, and, and perhaps this one is the more obvious way by which we might know that we are chosen and given to Jesus by the Father, and that is, have you obeyed his word? Not just in believing and receiving Him, but in following Him. By the way, another word for following Jesus is repentance. I know we don't often look at the word repentance in that way, but that's essentially what it means. When I repent, I stop sinning. And if I stop sinning, that means I start doing everything that's right. Well, everything that's right means doing everything that Jesus did. And that's following Him. Jesus says in verse 6, they have kept your words. Okay, have you kept Jesus' word? Now, Jesus pointed to exactly the same thing in John chapter 10 as that which marks out his sheep. In verses 27 and 28 of John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So here's again the question. Do you hear the voice of Jesus? Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Do you hear the voice of Jesus as he speaks to you in the Bible? Do you hear it now? Do you hear him speaking? Because this is his word. And are you following him? Are you following his example? Are you obeying his commands? This is the evidence that he points to above all others is how we can know that we belong to him, is the fact that our lives change, the fact that we begin to bear good fruit, whereas before we just bore bad fruit. So let me give you a few examples from Scripture. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, here it's talking mainly about the false prophets and how you can distinguish them from true prophets, but the same thing is true with regard to any believer, a good tree bears good fruit. He says, so every tree, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. That's true of the prophets, whether it's a true or a false prophet. But it's also true with regard to Christians. We can know whether or not somebody really believes in the Lord Jesus Christ by the fruit their lives bear. Jesus told us just recently in John chapter 15, in verse 2 and in verse 8, essentially the same thing. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now, here it's, it's the no fruit versus good fruit versus instead of the bad fruit versus good fruit. 
but there's still the idea here of good fruit. This is how we show ourselves. This is how we distinguish ourselves from the world. This is how we prove to others and even to ourselves that we are His disciples. It's not just the, the desire, the love, as it were, for the Lord Jesus Christ and the desire to want to glorify Him, but it is the actual glorifying of Him in the way that we live, bearing this fruit. And I think this last passage bears it out perhaps more clearly than any of the others in 1 John 3, verses 7 through 10. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin or practice sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. How you tell the difference between those who are chosen of God and, and those who are of the world? Well, John says it's obvious. Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of the devil, to break the power of sin, to set us free so that we would be able to live, you know, the life that Jesus calls us to live. And so how do you know you, that that's happened to you? Well, you're living as Jesus calls you to live. You're practicing righteousness perfectly, not at all. But you're still, that is the pattern of your life. So if you are one of God's elect, even though you won't be perfect in this life, and by the way, don't use that as an excuse not to try to be perfect, because that's often how we will use that. But realize you're not going to be perfect. Don't condemn yourself if you're not perfect. Don't say, I'm not a Christian because I'm not perfect, because there, there are no Christians who are perfect in this world. Perfection waits for glory. Okay. But if you are a believer, you will practice righteousness. There will be the consistent bearing of good fruit. And the reason you will do that, as John already told us, is that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil in your heart. He's given you his Holy Spirit. You now love him and you want to honor him. And that's why your life will go that direction. That's why you will follow the Lord Jesus. So that is how you know that you're one of God's elect and not a part of the world. Now, Jesus, as we've seen, is, is, has done His work. There's a particular focus to this work. Uh, and, you know, he, he lays down His life for His people. He prays for His people. We've seen how it is. We might know that we are one of His people. But the last question I just want to pursue for a moment is this. Understanding that, that there is a particular focus to the work of Jesus, that He prays for and He lays down His life only for the elect. Should that make any difference in, in our evangelism? <laughs> well, yes, it should, and no, it shouldn't. It just depends on which aspect of it we're, we're talking about here. Now, how shouldn't it make a difference? Well, it shouldn't make any difference with regard to the, the uh, objects, we might say, although they're really not objects, I suppose. Yeah, objects of our evangelism, okay? <laughs> we're the subjects, they're the objects. So we take the message to them. It shouldn't make any difference with regard to who we share the gospel with or to whom we share it with. Jesus said to His disciples in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Go into all the world, preach, he says, the gospel to all creation or to every creature, indiscriminately offer the gospel to everyone. Everyone who believes will be saved. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. That's not what Jesus is saying here, okay? But if you do believe, you do need to be baptized, okay? So we can offer it to everyone. It doesn't also make any difference, I believe, with regard to the Lord's sincerity in the offer of the gospel, because I do believe that God intends it for everyone, and I do believe His offer is sincere. 
And I think we see that in John 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. There is a sense in which God has a real desire for all men to repent, and He tells us in more than one place He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked might repent and be saved. So it, it, doesn't have, it doesn't make any difference with regard to, to, you know, to whom we share the gospel with or uh, God's sincerity. All who come to Him, He will not reject. But it does make a difference, I think, in a very positive way with regard to the results that we can expect in our evangelism. The fact that the Father has chosen some of the fallen human race to give to His Son as a reward, the fact that He's chosen, the fact that He's elected, the fact that Jesus prays and has prayed and laid down His life for those whom the Father has chosen means, again, that there will be some who respond to this message. There must be those who will come to Him in faith. It can't be otherwise. Now, this is something we really need to... to get a hold of because I think, again, all we, we usually think of when we think of evangelism is, you know, uh, I guess in, in credulity, uh, perhaps anger, uh, people making fun of us, uh, you know, rejecting us, maybe getting a little bit angry and so forth, and we really shouldn't be thinking in those terms. We should be looking not at the people that aren't going to come, at least at that particular moment, but we should be looking at the fact that God has a people He's going to give to His Son. Those people are still out there. There are still many to be called in. If there weren't, we wouldn't be here. We'd be in heaven. The whole thing would be over. We'd actually be in the new heavens and the new earth if all the elect were saved. There are still those out there who need to be reached. And so this can be an encouragement to us. We need to be encouraged by what the Bible teaches regarding election. God has chosen a people. We need to be encouraged by particular redemption that Jesus died and prays for those people. And we need to rejoice in the fact that we have the privilege of taking the gospel to these others knowing that God has determined to save them because that is the guarantee that our work is going to be successful. It's not going to be rejection, rejection, rejection. There are going to be those who come to the Lord. So let's be encouraged by what we've seen here this evening through the prayers of Jesus, through the prayers for His people, for His church, for those whom the Father has given to Him, that as we would evangelize, there will be those who believe. If that weren't true, we wouldn't be here this evening. We know God does show mercy to people. We know He intends to show mercy to others. So let's be encouraged to bring the gospel to as many as we can. Well, let's, uh, let's spend a moment in prayer, and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us apply everything.